wonder where you are. Are we open? Okay. This Veterans History Project interview was being conducted on Wednesday, July the 9th in the year 2008 here at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the library reference staff. Um, and I'm speaking with Mr. Richard Vanna. Uh, Mr. Vanna was born on December the 15th, uh, 1923, uh, in Chicago, and now lives in Des Plaines. Mr. Vanna learned of the uh, Niles Library's participation in the Veterans History Project through an article in a local newspaper, The Journal and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. Mr. Uh, Vanna has already been interviewed um, for the Library of Congress uh, VHP collection um, in association with Boy Scout Troop Number 6 when he was interviewed by uh, Chicago uh, TV uh, personage uh, Mr. Paul Mikey. Um, but Mr. Vanna's uh, story would very much strengthen the collection here at the Niles Library uh, as we attempt to uh, capture the spirit and achievement of American forces in World War II. So we're uh, looking forward to interviewing our neighbor from Des Plaines, as it were, this afternoon. Um, so, um, so, Mr. Vanna, when did you enter the service? Uh, January 1943. And were you living in Chicago at that time? Yes, at 4318 Lawrence. 4318 West no, Lawrence. Lawrence, Lawrence. Right near where you live. Right Kenneth where I live, yeah. I think you live at 4600 on Kenneth. That's right, right near yeah. memory, yeah. yeah. Did you, uh, had you completed high school at that time? Or? No, no. So you were, uh, you were in high school though, I mean. No, you just no I, I had left high school due to financial situations. Yeah. What uh, what high school were you attending at that time? Shures. Oh, the Bulldogs. Yeah, yeah. still going, still going. Yeah. yeah. So, what were you were, what were you actually doing before you were, got the call? At that time, I was working at Capper and Capper on 100, 100 North Michigan, Chicago. That was a men's a men's clothing store, and uh, uh, we also had a newsstand at uh, Kildare and Lawrence. My brother and I which we had from 1933. I was only 10 when we started that newsstand. <laughs> so, but we still had it at that time, to those years. Um, your family, had they been living in the United States a long time? Um, yes, my folks were born in Chicago. Born in Chicago. Uh, um, and uh, moved, uh, we lived at, uh, well, I was born on the south side, actually at uh, 1314 West 52nd Street. My, uh, I was baptized at Visitation Church. Oh, the famous Visitation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on 55th Street, I believe it was. Yeah. And then your family moved? Uh, we moved here when the Depression hit. Yeah. We moved here in 1932. To the north side. To 4838 North Lowell, which was a home of my mother's uh, brother, John. And then... Uh, Later, moved to 4739 Lowell, and then finally wound up at 4318 Lawrence, which is really Lowell and Lawrence. Yeah. So. so you were used to facing hardship uh, in well, growing up. Well, it's, 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 you know, you say time. hardship. Yeah. Depression years were difficult, and naturally, as, as a boy particularly. Uh, but everybody's in the same boat. You had a common bond, and. Uh, uh, you didn't really think that it was a hardship so much. My mom fed us on five bucks a week. I mean, I know that for a fact. And I, and I started delivering daily news on Saturday, where if I sold 15 papers, I got a quarter bonus. So I would wound up with uh, sold 17, and I would get 42 cents, <laughs> and which was pretty good at that time, you know. Yeah. And I think I was. Uh, well, probably nine when I started that, and then ten when we got the newsstand. So, um, so in the year 1942, you were probably expecting to be to be drafted. Oh yes, I, I was ready to go in, and uh, well, up until November or September of 42, uh, for whatever reason, as I recall, you had to be 21 to enlist on your own without your parents' consent. So uh, when uh, 
my brother went in, and then I went into the Marine Corps at the same time. It was Saturday to get in. That's when you were drafted? Yeah, well, I went as the Marine Corps. I, I, I volunteered for the Marines. Volunteered for the Marines yeah. when you were drafted? Yeah. Right. And your brother, did he also go in the Marines? No, maybe. 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 Why didn't you go in the Navy? Why did I go in the Marine Corps? Yeah. Well, I just liked the Marines, that's all. <laughs> I was kind of a, a, a liked adventure. It yeah. just seemed like the Marine Corps had a little more to offer than everything. And as a matter of fact, when I uh, was at boot camp, I asked to be, had two choices. One was the paratroopers and one was the infantry. And they put me in the artillery. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Shortly thereafter, about two weeks after I was in the artillery, they had a bulletin, a notice on the bulletin board for volunteers of the Raiders, and uh, myself and another fellow, Jack Thomas, volunteered for the Raiders, and that's how I got into the Raiders. So you left the artillery and went to the Raiders. To the Raiders. The Raiders all volunteer. At that time, it was 21 and under. I don't know what the situation was afterward, but at that time, you had to be 21 or under to volunteer for the Raiders. And was that also your sense of adventure that was... Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, well, not only that, not only the adventure part, but, uh, hey, I was a patriot. <laughs> I mean, I felt it. Well, yeah, I felt yeah. It. I mean, the American flag still brings tears to my eyes. And the Raiders were, you knew you were going to do something if you were in the, the Raiders. The Raiders were special. They really were. They were, uh, they were formed in January of 1942. Uh, and uh, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt wanted to come up with a outfit similar to the commandos. Jimmy Roosevelt was a, was a raider. J uh, James Roosevelt was a raider, uh, Franklin's son. And uh, well, that's how it all got started. The first raiders were Edson, and the uh, second raiders were Carlson. And actually, the raiders, when we didn't always work together until we reformed as the 4th Marines in 1944. It was 1944. We formed this, then we worked together. So, um, when you joined up, were you were you inducted then at uh, Fort Sheridan or? No, 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 no. I was went downtown to a recruiting office. And then you yeah. and then you went off to. Uh, and then they. Went by train to San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. Oh, Pendleton or no? Pardon me. Was that Pendleton or? No, we went to Camp Elliott. Camp Elliott. Well, well actually, the uh, the uh, the uh, base, Marine Corps base, is where the boot camp was, and then went to Pendleton from there. And uh, the Raider training was at Tent Camp Two, which was just outside of um, San Onofre. Yeah, was Ocean, the, was Ocean side, near Ocean side. So you received special training as a raider? Oh yes, yes, it was all special training. It was, it was very intense, very intense. In terms of physical demands and, oh, absolutely. and technical skills? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You fired every weapon and, and uh, well, they, I, I wasn't great at uh, <laughs> uh, karate or anything like that, but I was fair, you know. Yeah. But uh, they, they taught you all the tricks, you know. And did everybody make it through the Raider training? Not everybody. Yeah. No, the first night we got into camp, they met us on a, what they call a fire um, fire trail up of mountains and so forth. They broke us out at midnight. <laughs> and that's how it was right on the road. But it was, it was, it was intense, but almost fun in a sense. It was a challenge. So that's a better way to put it. It was a challenge. Yeah. Was that the first time you ever spent any length of time away from home or had traveled in the United States? Yes. I, I never um, I never traveled anywhere ever yeah. until that time. Well, that must have been an interesting experience, having all these people from different parts of the well, country. Well, that was my point. Yeah. Actually, my point today was uh, with young people and I encourage everybody to, to, to get into the army or, or, or Marines or whatever because just the adventure itself and the meeting of the people from all sections of the country are so just different, that's all. Yeah. And you were able to get along with everybody? Uh... The Marines where you get along. Uh -huh. Everybody got along. <laughs> well, I just want to go to a story on Okinawa. Yeah. Okay, there are some guys that don't get along. And Roy Godwin and Fred Aerosmith 
were two that didn't get along too well. Personality conflict or whatever it was. But we were on a, on a hill on o, in Okinawa, and um, the order came through to hold your fire. And Roy was halfway up the hill, station positioned halfway up the hill. And he let a round go down into the valley below. And I yelled up to him, Roy, did you hear him? They said, no, hold your fire. And at that instant, a Nambu a machine gun burst right under him, kicked up all the dirt in front of him. And he yelled back at me, like, what I say, what I say. He's from North Carolina. And I told him, at that very instant, another burst goes off and he gets hit. It looked like the head. The first one out to him was Aerosmith, the guy that they didn't get along, get along with. What the first story. guy out to him. He starts dragging him down, and of course the, the nimble catches him, and they riddle him pretty good too. And so we threw a smoke grenade out there when I got up there. They were laying in each other's arms, and their blood flowing into one another. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, here's two guys that didn't get along, but the first one out to them. I mean, that's what the Marine Corps does for you. It was unbelievable. So that was, um, it was a very effective training camp. No, and then the, and, and, was, and then the Raider was, training was very effective. It, it certainly was. It, yeah. it proved itself in action. Yeah. So the Raiders, see, the, originally the, the idea behind it was to go behind enemy lines. Oh, right, like the British commandos, go yeah. behind lines. Yeah. Behind the lines. We did that at Macon Island. We did it at Guadalcanal. Uh, in the canal, it was, it was it was like a decoy to, to drag, to draw the nips into that area while the main force of the, of the uh, uh, battalions and so forth were coming from another way. I'm not going to go into the details, but those yeah. are... The, um, so, you, your mother, two, your mother's two of her sons went in the service at the same time. Is that right? Yeah, well, just there's just two of us. Jack, yeah. Jack was uh, in the Navy, and I was uh, in the Marine Corps. That's all. There's just the two of us. And, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was at Emeru, jumping into the Higgins boat, I had a complete dislocation of my right ankle. They call it a medial dislocation. My my bottom of my foot was facing my was facing me. <laughs> so they flew me to New Hebrides. Yeah, New Hebrides. And Jack, who was on a destroyer escort. Your brother. Yeah, was on a destroyer escort. They docked there for a day, and he came to the hospital to see me. Yeah. So anyway, I was there for about six weeks, and then back to the canal. You know? <laughs> so when you complete um, raider training in Southern California in the San Diego area, and we went right overseas. You went right overseas. You were private at that time. Yes. And then, yeah. and then you go by boat or if you fly. We went no, 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 by ship. We went on the USS Mount Vernon. The USS Mount Vernon. The USS Mount Vernon, which was a Queen Mary type mm -hmm. uh, um, steamship, really big, and uh, went right to New Caledonia. That was where the Raiders had their training down there. That's where we, we got many the jungle shows. training. Well, it yeah. was. New, New Caledonia wasn't so jungle. It was just so. It was a, it was a French um, area, you know. They and Noumea was the capital there. There wasn't any action down there. That was a training point. That was where the Raiders had their training camp. So we went down there as reserves, and then. When they came back, they were the, the Raiders. Were, the Raiders had been up on New Georgia, had been down to uh, Auckland, New Zealand, on a Liberty, and then came back to uh, New Caledonia. So was that about two or two, three weeks a month? You're in training at uh, on New Caledonia. Oh, we're there. You train every day for for a couple. Oh, absolutely. They get ready for whatever action you're going into. We, so how long were you on New Caledonia before they? Let's see, it was 1944, probably not more than, uh, I would say, we're there for Christmas, Thanksgiving, 
on Christmas. And then I think we went to Emeru like in January. I'm not, I can't remember that exactly. Because we went, after Emeru, I, of course I went to New Hebrides because I was, you know, I was injured there. And then I came back to the canal probably in April and we prepared for Guam. And we had to hit Guam, on the, we were supposed to hit Guam on the 1st of June. So our, 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 all of our training there was getting ready. You don't know where you're going to go, but, but they have pretty much an idea of what the terrain is like and so forth, and, you, and they train you accordingly. So we were always the first wave um, on Guam, and we hit, but we didn't hit it on June 1st because Saipan became so intense that they kept us aboard that ship for 57 days, uh, LST. And uh, the only time we, we had to stop in the marshals to refuel early in July, and then went on to hit Guam July 21st. I was hit in the head, I was, a bullet hit me in the head on Guam. But uh, I just went back, they, it, it grazed my head. It went through my helmet, grazed my head, and knocked me out. I was bleeding profusely, but we just put a bandage on it. I went back aboard a ship, and they scraped the metal out, and the next day I was back in the front line. Yeah. <laughs> Silly question, bullets can pierce helmets. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That bullet went in here. Matter of fact, I'll guarantee you that I really feel I've had a had a uh, guardian angel because we were hitting, just approaching a, 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 a knoll and it was whether I should go this way or that way. And I had my head turned this way and I said, so help me, I felt something turn my head. I, I didn't feel like I was doing it by myself. And as I did that, that bullet hit me, went into the helmet, went around in the side, tore up my head. I was knocked out, well, let's say maybe 30 seconds, you know. I went down to my knees, and then uh, one of the guys had a bandage. We put a bandage on it, and then they said, well, get back to the beach. So I went back to the beach, and back aboard ship, they, uh, so they took the metal out of it and back in the front. Yeah. Mr. Vanna, you mentioned your, uh, your guardian angel here. Yes. Um, but in, in, in terms of... Um, important facts that keep your spirit going as a human being. Uh, you were married before you went overseas? Yes, 1940, August 7th, 1943. August 7th, 1943. Yeah, I didn't get, then I didn't see my, we went overseas in September, and I didn't see mom until uh, Christmas Day, 1945. So when you went into the service in 42, did you already know your wife at that time? Oh yes, Ma, Marion was only 13 when we were going steady. Wow. <laughs> she was 13 years old. We met in, in the fall of 1938. And uh, when she was 14 and I was 15, we were engaged, verbally. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> and as you see, we had 10 children. 10 children. <laughs> and so then, um, so she must have got permission from her parents or something, and then she flew out to you in California yes, to get married? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we went to Vegas, actually. To Vegas, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, but uh, anyway, we're getting a little off the track of yeah. the other thing, but uh, uh, as, far as, as far as the guardian angel thing, here, truthfully, prayer is a preparation for danger in an armor for battle, and that's how I felt. And I don't consider myself any braver than anybody else. I was just given a strength and a courage, strength and courage through, through prayer that helped me. I don't know what it could do for other people, and I don't know that all guys ever, how many guys did that, but to me that was my strength. And it wasn't a question, it was just a question maybe compared to David and Goliath, and I'm not putting myself in that class, but his feelings were that the Lord was with him. And whatever happens, happens. But I have the strength and courage to endure whatever that will be. Yeah, so um, 
religious faith was important. Without a question. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, again, I, I can't... I've seen yeah. it. I, I recommend it to everybody, but... <laughs> so, um, and you were able to stay in some kind of touch with the people back home through correspondence and mail? Well, we could write one or another. Uh, I mean, I wrote every day that I could when we were in training, like on the canal, like Guadalcanal, or when we went back to Guam. I, 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 I wrote Marion every day that I could, and she wrote me every day. The only I didn't get, when we were born ship 57 days, you know, going to Guam, naturally you didn't get any mail. But when I got, the, there was all kinds of mail waiting for me. Some of this, well, no, none of this is, this is all I got in Japan, because I, there's no way you could keep all that mail. Yeah. So, did you, I wonder if the Raiders ever were, found themselves in a place where the USO shows, or any famous entertainers? No. I was never in the USO show. Never in the USO Never USO. saw the, no. didn't have any leave except the weekend that I married Mom. Marian. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in terms of combat, so your, your unit, um, First saw combat and well, Emeru was was very mild. Uh, again, now, now the Raiders, don't forget, I got there, we got there as replacements in 1943. They had only been to Guadalcanal and uh, Bougainville, New Georgia, all came while we were in training on, on New Caledonia. So our first action outside of Emeru was Guam. And I say that was the 21st of July. And uh, that, that, was a, that, was, that was a heck of a landing because I know Tarawa and uh, Iwo Jima were probably the bloodiest. But Guam was a, was a mess. They must have, uh, they, they had mines, the, the, the beach was, was mined, uh, the artillery was, was zeroed in on you. We must have lost at least 20 of the LVTs. LVTs are the alligators. They go right in to the beach, you know, and and take you up maybe three, four hundred yards, depending on how far you have to go. They're like a tank without a top. So we lost at least 20 of them right on the beach. And it was, it was, it was, it was. And there were how many men in each one? Do you, uh, about 18. Oh dear. Yeah, we had about 17, 18. It's just about a squad in, in each one. Now they, they weren't all, all these weren't lost, they were, but they were, the, the, the uh, LVTs were uh, hit so they couldn't go any further. So, so you, the Raiders, you, the Raiders see frontline action at Guam? And then you continue on to Okinawa. 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 We were after Guam, there were other actions, of course, Peleliu, the Philippines, uh, and other actions after Guam. But we went back to Guadalcanal, <clears throat> and then got ready for the Okinawa campaign. And that didn't come until April 1st, 1945, <clears throat> which was Easter Sunday, of course. <clears throat> and. Uh, we were the first wave there, but uh, the resistance on the beach was very was was practically nothing. <clears throat> the way we figured it, that out, the, the the Japs wanted to fight us on their own on their own uh, uh, their own way. They were dug in so deep in the hills and in caves. And when we were about the, oh, the oh, about the tenth day on to the eighty second day, it was just a new adventure every day. So, uh, Okinawa was the most sustained period of, of action that we had. Well, I was there ninety nine days, eighty two days before it was secure, and then seventeen days we did patrols and so forth. There was only three of us from our outfit that went through 99 days. Upchurch, myself, and Carter. And uh, it, I think when I look at it now, you wonder how you ever. <laughs> I didn't think of it then, but when you see the movie, the war pictures and the uh, war film of it, 
you, you really wonder how the heck did we ever do this? You know? Yeah. So were you, when you're on Okinawa, are you you've been promoted to corporal? Or? Yes, I was. I don't remember when that came about, but it was summer. After, after, matter of fact, it had to be after the uh, Guam campaign. I'm sure it was because I had already taken over a squad. So you were a squad leader. Yes, yeah. So a corporal usually. No fire team. Corporal <clears throat> was a fire team leader, not a squad leader. I was a squad leader as a corporal, but usually a sergeant was the. Uh, was a, uh, a squad leader. And then a fire team is composed of how many? Four. Four. And is that like four riflemen or? VAR man, which is automatic weapon. Browning okay. automatic. It's it's, it's uh, um, and then and then uh, three riflemen. One is the is the uh, is the uh, assistant to the VAR VAR man carries extra ammunition for him. And then you, you're, as the... There's a fire team leader carried M1. You carried an M1. M1, yeah. yeah. The old threes went out, uh, oh, the letter, I think early in 42, the M1, I can't remember when the M1s came in, but yeah. they were in, in, in 43 they were in. Yeah. So um, you were kind enough to send me a, um, a copy here from the congressional record of a... Um, Resolution or oh, uh, Senator, Senator Dole. Dole? <coughs> yeah. Pardon me. Yeah, Senator Elizabeth Dole, yeah. So this is on or about the first of June nineteen forty five Baker Company. Do you do you ever think of that particular do we ever think do you ever it? think of that day? Well, Rocky and I talk quite a bit and, and we often wonder what happened to Richie. We've looked him up whenever we could find out. But uh, again, you know, this is just one story yeah. that comes out. And it was a, and you received a citation for bravery for this, right? Yes, that's, that's correct. But uh, again, there's so many of them that, were, that, that, that occurred that were never reported. I'm, I'm sure. It's just, it just unbelievable. So the American forces, uh, are victorious at Okinawa. Pardon me. The American forces are victorious at Okinawa. Oh, yes. But at but at some cost. Well, we lost over ten thousand yeah. dead. And then um, and then most people, you, you were thinking you're preparing for the invasion of. of well, we were. We were getting ready for the invasion of Japan when the bomb went off. Yeah. <laughs> we were back at Guam then. Sure, we were preparing to for the. Okinawa is only 400 miles, 350 miles from from uh, Japan. I mean, Iwo Jima was only 660 miles, and that was so important to get that because of the airstrips, so the planes could 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 bomb the mainland of Japan without having without having to refuel, or they had to yeah. get back there and make the round trip, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be ditching somewhere. So um, there must have been great celebration when Japan surrendered then. Well, yes, of course <coughs> we did. <coughs> Pardon me. But it was more relief than celebration. A I relief, because you think, yeah. Uh, I think it's in a sense it was a combination of relief and celebration. But then we got uh, August 27th, we were in Japan. I was going to say, then <laughs> you still <laughs> go to Japan, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, the thing is, is we were looking forward to going home, and then we got the word, no, we're, we're going to Japan. And my understanding, one of the reasons was that the fourth, the original fourth regiment, went down in Bataan, and we, and then many of them were sent to Japan for uh, in prisons there. And the, our, being the fourth Rangers, the fourth regiment, we went to Japan and, and freed them. One, some of the ones that were freed. And then we occupied there. I didn't leave there until well, almost Thanksgiving. Did you you sail in a boat into Yokohama or oh, yeah. Tokyo? Oh you know, yeah, yeah, we just, we, yeah, we came. I don't remember what kind of a ship we were on, but we, we weren't on LSTs, and we came in on a regular uh, steamboat or something, whatever it was. 
<laughs> How did you find the Japanese homeland? I mean, did you have any ideas or well, feelings see, about it? I was it? pretty naive. Yeah. Uh, I, to me, the war is over. We shake hands. Everybody's friends now. <laughs> that was my idea. And, you know, it was funny. I truly made a lot of good friends there. Uh, but I was, I didn't realize how the position I put myself in many times because I traveled on, they had, some, they had electric trains there, very similar to our uh, Illinois Central or even probably to our elevated. And I traveled through Yokohama and Tokyo on, by myself. You couldn't carry any weapon with you. And uh, the thought that there's, there's a lot of military, there had to be some military Japs left around that had some ideas about uh, getting rid of you, you know. But I, I never had any fear of that at all. And uh, travel those trains had only one bad experience. There was three nips that kind of looked like they were trouble. And I backed up to the back of the, of the train, but nothing ever came to them. And as a matter of fact, uh, when I transferred, like in Yokohama, they would get to know me. They would have a sweet potato sitting on the, on the pot belly stove for me. And I would bring candy or whatever I could bring to them, too, you know. Was that in the train station or something? Yeah, like the there? train. That's where you transfer, just yeah. like where you have train stations here, you know. Yeah. And they, they, they all treated me great. One time on the way back from Tokyo, I missed the train at Yokohama that takes me back to uh, to Yokosuka. We were at Yokosuka. The last train had already left. So I was stuck there. And I, I uh, saw a Jap walking with a little tool of some kind, which is like our streetcar motorman he had. And I said, well, this guy's got to be a motorman. So in my best Japanese, I. He, he informed me that he was the motorman in the first train out. So he says, come on with me. I would go to an old shack. There's seven nips in there. They fixed me on a, 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 a old straw pad and gave me a little gray blanket. I slept with those seven nips that night. And we got up at 4.30 in the morning and took the first train back to Yokosuka. But Probably weeks later, I said, what the heck were you thinking? You could have disappeared, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you think that the Lord wasn't watching over you. Right? Yeah. Or the dragon angels weren't watching over so you. So you were like on a, a, a leave from the base or something? Well, you'd get time off. You'd get I had, time I had off. A, I, see, there we were, I had a watch from 4.30 in the morning on. And I missed that watch. And Russ Bull took care of that for me. <laughs> we cover up for each other, you know. Yeah. So I didn't get back to them early the next morning. Yeah. But, uh, so was it during your time in Japan that um, Dr. Oh, Matsumoto... Oh, yes. I, I, I uh, just happened to meet him on the train, and he invited me to his house, because he spoke perfect English. But he was blind. Yeah, blind. Yeah, but he was with his daughter, oh. Kamiko. And uh, she, uh, they invited me to the house, and then I would, I, he'd like, he, he wanted, he liked to smoke a pipe and so forth. So I brought him tobacco and so forth. And they had me over several times during the time I was there, probably four or five times during the several weeks that we were there. I didn't leave until November, around Thanksgiving, I think. Anyway, uh, when I was knew I was going to be going back to the States, but then he gave me this as a memento. So. And then, incidentally, when he died in 1948, they sent a special messenger to where I worked to tell me that he had passed on. So we've become pretty good friends. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. You, uh, you're, you're fighting Japanese I know. I military know. personnel, and then you're in their home country, and it's like a different... The civilians are different or something here. They, they definitely were. Um, the Nips were cruel. I mean, the, 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 the military were, were like, when we freed a couple of the prisoners, they told us some stories. They would urinate in their rice and give it to them. Things of that nature. Yeah. And it's almost like a thuggish, brutal tradition, which is... They bayonet you. I mean, they just... 
the people I met there were all pretty decent folks, you know. Yeah. And even those seven nips I slept with, I don't know. I, I, I can't explain why human nature. I got yeah. along with them. You yeah. Know, just, yeah. Now the two on the table here, we've taken the picture of this to add at the end of the interview. Yeah. Um, the two samurai swords. Those you found those? Uh, no. Well, her, we were in. This was on Okinawa too, and we were. Bill Hofer was our platoon leader. Bill Hofer was a quarterback for Notre Dame in 1937 and 38. Wow. <laughs> and he was our platoon leader. I don't even got time for this, but I'll a brief story. Bill's picture was in the Tribune on the front page of the sports section, intercepting a pass against Northwestern. And they had little dots how he ran the pass back for a touchdown. So when Bill came to be our platoon leader, I told him about that story and he he didn't remember the incident but anyway he was our platoon leader and Bill and I got along pretty well and at that time I was already a squad leader and uh, we were we were, uh, we were having a heck of a firefight I'm talking about you know bullets flying all over and so forth we, we finally got to a crest of a hill and things were quiet and he said listen we got to find out what's down there he says Anna <laughs> Go down there and see, reconnoiter, you know. I'm not going to go into the details, but, but my job was to go down there and I could see a shell hole down in the middle. And again, I, I wasn't the brave, but I was a gambler as well as a, my prayers. And, and I said, well, no, that's about an even money shot, you know. <laughs> but I said, okay, I got to go. So I ran down the hill and I got to that shell hole, there's a nip in there. So I leaped, and as I leaped, he shot and fired under me. So I landed on top of him, and, and that night we, we uh, he, had a, he had a Samari sword, and I took his Samari sword. And that night, we, we had our line there. And I won't say it was a Banzai charge, but it was a, it was a attempt to get through the lines and uh, killed several Japs out in front and another one was out there with a, you had to be careful because you, you don't want to, they could be uh, uh, booby trapped, you know, but these are freshly killed so I didn't have to worry about that. And then, then of course... Uh, so you got both those samurai swords in about just 24 same. hours. Yeah, yeah, less than that, just overnight one I got in the, in the late afternoon and the other one overnight, you know. <clears throat> And Dick Friedrich, who brought them back for me, he was run over by a six-wheeler on, Gu on Guadalcanal. Ten months later, I can't remember how much later, if this isn't some kind of a miracle, he comes back as a replacement, comes right back to the same company, Charlie Company. He, I was in B Company, but he was in Charlie Company. But we went to Raider training together. But can you imagine a replacement going right back to the same outfit? They don't do that, you know what I mean? But just, he wound up in the same exact outfit, but he only lasted a day or so because of his, 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 his ankle would, would not hold him up. So I said, Dick, how about taking this stuff back for me? You know, he was going back and I just gave it to him that next morning and he brought him back and next thing I knew we were in my house. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just some time later, but I mean. Did you, um did you ever think of making a career of the military? Or? Oh, yes. If I hadn't been married, I would have stayed in. I would have definitely stayed in. Matter of fact, I was up for sergeant at the time, and had I stayed in, I would have made the sergeant rank. And then you probably would have gone to Korea then, or? Without a question. My McGinnis, who was, was a, what a raider he was, was received a, a commission in the field. You don't ever see that very often. He became a lieutenant in the field, and uh, he came back, went to Korea, came back again, and he gets killed by a car on, in California. His sister wrote me from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He was from Yazoo City, Mississippi. Yeah. So um, after you complete the, the occupation duty in Japan, then you, it's a ship back to the United States. Yeah, it was late late December, or late late November. We left by ship. It had to be probably the middle of November because 
We went by the Aleutians and came back to San Diego and then took the train back to, um, I was going to Great Lakes. Great Lakes. And when we got into Chicago, I jumped off the train and I called Marion and said, Mom, meet me at the Ravenswood L. <laughs> oh, so at that time, was that at uh, Lawrence and Kimball? It came out to Lawrence and Kimball. Lawrence yeah. and Kimball. Yeah. And I said, meet me at the Ravenswood She was there. <laughs> yeah. We took the streetcar home. What, yeah. a, what, a, what a reuniting, I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. So, did you find it. Um, was it difficult to readjust to civilian life? You know, it wasn't for me. I don't know. I, a lot of guys did, I guess, but I, I don't know. I was just so glad to be, be home. Did you go back to work to Capra, with Capra and Camp? I was back there within a week. They kept your job and everything? Yeah, yeah. I was back there in a week. So did you um, did you use the GI Bill for anything? or? I, you know, so I was just, Marion was always upset with me about that because I never did. I was able to work and I never went to school or anything else and never took advantage of all the benefits that they offered, you know. It was really too bad. Yeah. But uh, I went to the, after, in 1950, I moved to Des Plaines in 1950 and I went for the, worked for the post office in Des Plaines for five years before we got into the cab business. And then, um, so you, you stayed in touch with your wartime buddies, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Because I would imagine the bond between oh, the Raiders oh, they're, they're, you're, among the Raiders. As I say, we have a reunion coming up August. You know? Yeah. Uh, it, there's a camaraderie that you form that's it's impossible to express with, except by the heart. Yeah. Except by the heart. So you're a member of the, are you also a member like the Veterans of Foreign Wars? No, I, I was with the VFW and it, I just didn't keep up my, my, uh, Dues and so forth. Yeah. I'm nothing against it. Believe me, they're great. But I just didn't. But, but I was at the, with the Marine Corps League, and and uh, with the Raiders had their own um, organization, yeah. which is very depleted right now. There's not too many left. However, the families of the are honorary members now. Mm. So. So the and the reunion this year is going to be held in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And is there still a Raider division within the Marines? No, no. No. We, we disbanded in 1944. It was disbanded. In 1944. The, the, the use for the Raiders was no longer there because it was hit and run. That was your idea, hit and run. And that was not there. But, but you were still elite infantry, so they used us for that. It became the fourth, with the fourth, four Raider battalions. There were only four Raider battalions. The four Raider battalions became the fourth regiment. And then we went to Guam as part of the first provisional brigade where we received the uh, Naval Unit Citation, the 4th Regiment did. And then we went to Guam as part of the first, as part of this, or not, uh, Guam was the first provisional brigade. We went to Okinawa as part of the 6th Division. But it was still all basically Raider trained men, and it's it's true then that um, the, the Raiders achieved such fame that the football team. Oh, the Oakland Raiders are named after us. Yeah. yeah how did that come to be? Or well, what's his name? Ray, the owner. Al Davis. Al, Al Davis. Davis. Al Davis was a Marine, not a Raider, but he must have just liked us. But the, yeah, the Oakland Raiders are named after us. They, they care. Well, our insignia is very similar to theirs on the helmet. Oh, the skull, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, well, it we had some great football players with us. In, in, our, in addition to the guy from Notre Dame. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Joe Andreco from Fordham. Uh, um, Al, um, Al Bauman from Wisconsin. Dave Schreiner. All killed. Oh, they were all killed. But great guys, yeah, and uh, a lot of other basketball players, and they had some really great guys. Who listen? There's man, I can't. I wish I could think of a couple others that uh, really, really know, but I can't think of them now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, at this stage of the interview, we usually ask the question that they recommend is, um, how do you think your military service and experiences in the military affected your life? 
Well, first place, the Marine Corps builds character. I mean, it's just, just, it's just an experience that uh, you, you, you can't even explain. It's a feeling inside of you. It's, you're proud but humble because the opportunity to serve with the kind of men that you were with. You went to Subchurch, 17 years old when we hit the beach at Okinawa. He wasn't 18 until April 14th, we hit April 1st. I mean, can you imagine? And don't forget, we were all 21 or under when we, when we volunteered. I was only 20 at that time. I was an old man <laughs> compared to some of them. You know. It was, it was a, and how as far as it affected my life, uh, I can only say that uh, God has been very generous. And that's all I can say. Do you think your military experience uh, influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Probably so. A lot of things I would do differently than they're doing, you know, that I would. The first place people can they can't even imagine. I don't care what they see on television or what you, you have to have been there. And see the blood flowing out of your buddy's mind dripping all over you. Like that. Mary? Yeah, I'm in that interview, Mary. Yeah. Okay, sweetheart. Bye. My daughter, she's our oldest daughter. She, she would, she could cook when she was ten. Wow. <laughs> that, um, my wife was a saint. Yeah. Is a saint. Yeah. And then your family, you still have family in the area, do you? There are uh, seven of them in Des Plaines. Oh. One in Bensonville, who just moved to Bensonville from Des Plaines, and then two in Minnesota, yeah. in Minneapolis, but. Pammy will fly down here for a for a birthday party. <laughs> They're very close. Yeah. They're very close. Yeah. And that that's my wife, mom, their, their mother. She took such great pride in her children. It's the only reason she hated to leave was because. Uh, no. Yeah. Um, so, thinking back about the. Your military experience, it's just that um, you would agree that the state was probably like, was it that, uh, I don't know who said it, was it Sherman that said that war is hell or something like that? I mean, it's well, it, it is, but to, listen, you do what you have to do for your country. This is your country. Yeah. This is what burns me with people. They ask you to do something, you have to do it. I mean, they're not always right, but this is your duty. Patriotism has come back somewhat, but it was never what it was like at World War II. Yeah. I mean, that, that was incredible. Not only from the standpoint of the boys and the men in service, but the, 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 the people at home. Like Marion worked for Admiral, making radios and so forth, or airplanes, and, so, and, 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 and it was just it was just a team operation. You had to have the people here. Turning out the Absolutely. material and the initiatives. Even yeah. the guys that couldn't go into service, it's a, I give them credit for what they did here. Yeah. It was a unity that you never would imagine. It's amazing that the United States could uh, fight on two fronts and project power and well, that, troops and that's, supplies. That's, and, the, that's my point. Yeah. The, the co it takes cooperation, teamwork all the way. So is, is there any, at this point, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in the interview? Yeah, just Father Redmond. We never oh, Father, Father Redmond. Redmond. We, wrote, we wrote his name. <laughs> yeah. What about Father Redmond? How can we forget yeah. Father Redmond? He is absolutely an inspiration, an example. Father would hold mass on a tree stump on a jungle battlefield. He would give the last rites in a, a, a mortar barrage, a nimble machine gun fire. He didn't care what it was. He was going to give those last rites to those guys. 
there again, he had to be had some special care of some kind because he was, again, I'm not saying we're, fear is so hard to describe. To say we were without fear, he and I both, isn't exactly right, I suppose, but it, it was because there was tension and everything else. But you had that power of prayer that was so important. You, you just relied on the Lord's goodness and, and, and whatever he decided to do with you. I mean, there's just no way to explain it other than that. So Father Redmond made it through the war okay? He just died... Oh, he, he, he was 90-something. Grand <laughs> age, yeah. But listen, when, when he was there, he was already like 50 or something. Well, yeah. What a man he was. Rugged and... Where was he from, Chicago or no? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't think so. I think he was more from the West Coast. Yeah. And that's where he wound up. He just an unbelievable man. Well, on that note of uh, admiration, I think that's a good point to end okay. the interview. Thank you very much, Mr. Vanna. Right. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. Up some time and, then Japan. <laughs> and these guys, this is what they bet. This is what they owed me. And here's where I paid them out and so forth. It was really... It was really how'd you learn how to run a book, you joined? Well, I worked on a book. <laughs> oh, did you? On the North Bank. <laughs> And Adams and Marbury. Oh, yeah. 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 Did yeah. you bet the horses, too? We got two horses. I should have brought pictures with me. We own two horses. It's called Always Faithful Stable, after the Marine Corps. Two okay. of my Marine buddies, my son, Timmy, and myself. I should have brought that stuff with me. Can I? Can you leave this with me? I'd like sure. to take a okay. here, So this was in... Here, here, here. here yeah, order. this was in Japan? That was in Japan. I don't get out. I mean, I remember I told you about the 57 days of World Ship. When we, when we got to um, the Marshalls, my dad sent the, the, uh, the sports section, the Tribune over. That was like gold. Or, well, yeah, yeah. But the, all he sent me was the race results because they had the, they had, the uh, had the charts, you know, and this horse by a quarter of a length and so yeah. on. So, so, well, hey, 57 days aboard a, aboard a ship is get kind of boring, play peanut or everything else. So I said, hey, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll start a, I'll start a book, and I, I put up sheets with the names of the horses on. I had all the races here, you know. But I put the names of the horses on, make a bet a nickel or a dime, or a quarter was as much as you could bet. Nickel was the minimum. And then I would announce the race. Like a rule by a half a length, and here comes whirling on the outside. No. <laughs> there you go, because you had heard, did you, you had heard races announced when you were in the bookies. When I was, when I was in seventh grade, eighth grade, I did a announcing of, a, of the Kentucky Derby, uh, you know, imaginary. And I was only in seventh grade at Palmer School. <laughs> You went to Palmer School. Yeah, yeah I know where Palmer is. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth Adams. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, That's where I graduated from Palmer. Yeah, and then... Uh, and, then and then, anyway, uh, I, I would... I would, I probably should have gone into announcing. Yeah, <laughs> you would have been a great announcer. Because Phil Georgette was a great announcer. Oh, God. Best horse race announcer. You know, and he did some other stuff, too, but he was great. Nick Timmy... Timmy writes an article. I should have brought that along for the Illinois Racing News. Oh, I got it. Oh, next time I see, I'll bring yeah. that stuff with me. I'll bring that stuff with me. Thanks for the uh, yeah. okay. the addendum on the uh, booking, bookie yeah. in Japan. Oh, I'll tell you, we had so much fun with that. Well, actually, when we left the Marshall, we only had a week or so before we had hit uh, uh, Okinawa. But... Uh, the guy's got the biggest bang out of it. I'm really <laughs>